the first panel of the last day of Lyme Crime. It is Law and Order Lyme Regis. Uh, and today we have, I hope you can see, a panel of, um, are we on gallery view or are we on single view? I think you can see everybody now. No, no, that's speaker view, is it? Gallery view. We have a panel that is made up of a number of writers and somebody who we hope will become a writer once we finish putting the pressure on him today. Uh, the first on the panel is Lisa Cutts. Uh, Lisa is the only woman you'll see on the panel, and therefore she doesn't need to hold her hand up. If, if she can, that's great. Uh, Lisa, is a, um, Lisa is a detective in the Kent Police. Uh, very, very much a long-term experienced detective of serious crime down in Kent. Lisa has two degrees that qualify her to do what she does. She has a law degree and I think it's an applied criminal investigation degree as well. So that's something that she can bring into play in both the day job and also into Lisa's books. Uh, Lisa has written six novels, Never Forget and Remember Remember, which are the DC Nina Foster books. Uh, and then her more recent books, Mercy Killing, Buried Secrets, Lost Lives, and out this year, and I'm sure she'll tell us about it shortly, whether it's out yet or not, uh, Don't Trust Him, which comes out this year. We also have, uh, next to Lisa on my view, but I'm not sure if it is on your view, Neil Lancaster. Neil, you say hello. Neil Hi. is our second cop. Neil uh, is a former military policeman initially, and then 25 years with the Metropolitan Police, uh, dealing with extremely serious and organised crime. Uh, Neil is a specialist in surveillance and covert policing techniques and he'll be telling us all about that uh, shortly. Neil now lives up in the wilds of Scotland and I'm convinced it's to hide away from the people that he has been following throughout his career. Uh, Neil is now the author of, at the moment, two Tom Novak books. Um, sort of, he'll tell us about those in due course. It's an interesting um, interesting sort of spin we want to put on that in terms of what Neil writes. But he writes a Tom Novak book, so I believe he's in the middle of writing something else and we've got more Novak to come and he'll tell us all about that in due course. Uh, Imran Mahmood. Uh, Imran, say hi. Hi. Hi everyone. Let me get you on the main screen if you say hi, certainly my main screen. Um, oh, what's this? Someone is telling us they can only see the person speaking, so I'm not in gallery view. I apologise. Thank you very much for that, Judith. Um, right, now hopefully that's gallery view. Um, Imran, criminal barrister, also a civil barrister, but mainly criminal barrister, since 1992. So despite the fact that he looks 10 years younger than me, he's been doing this job 10 years longer than I have, which I was quite shocked about when I did a bit of research on Imran. Um, Imran works in Pump Court in London. Um, he's experienced in all manner of extremely serious criminal cases, murders, um, blackmail, uh, kidnaps, appeals, etc., etc. Uh, this significant criminal practice. He's also a very, very highly critically acclaimed author. Uh, his first book, uh, You Don't Know Me, uh, we will talk about that again. We were talking about that before we came on screen, uh, is one of uh, the, the best legal books and the most unique legal books um, out there at the moment, and certainly one of the best I've read. I'm always intrigued to work out how he's going to follow up on that because it's such a completely unique concept. Um, I'll get on to our final guest in a moment. I'll mention me quickly, uh, Tony Kent. That's not my name when I'm a lawyer. I've been um, a criminal barrister now for nearly 20 years, 19 years. Uh, I was in chambers uh, in London for a very long time. I now work in the chambers of my own in order to give me time to write. Uh, my practice, as we just said about Imran's, mainly serious crime, murder, drugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, purely criminal defence. Uh, and then our special guest today, if nobody else minds me saying that we have a special guest, uh, is Mr. Well, his Honour, in fact, his Honour Judge Nigel Nithman QC. Nigel, can you say hello? hello? Just to make sure that everyone knows which one you are. Nigel was called to the bar, we're going to make him seem very old. Uh, Nigel was called to the bar in 1976. He's been a QC since 1997, so he's been a QC longer than I have been a barrister. He became a recorder, which is a part-time judge, in 2000. He was the chairman of the Criminal Bar Association, which basically makes him the boss of all of the criminal barristers, uh, in 2013 to 2014. He has been a Crown Court judge, first in Luton, now in St Albans, uh, since 2017. During his career as a barrister, Nigel led me in a number of cases, but then some much more impressive stuff than that. Um, Nigel was rated by the Chambers and Partners um, Criminal Bar Directory, or the Bar Directory, which is 
just so you understand, the only independent directory to the criminal bar to, to say who you should and should not have if you're charged with murder, as one of the top ranking silks in the country for a silk being QC for a very, very long time. So we're very lucky to have Nigel on board because if we're gonna be talking about real life, uh, and that's the man who knows a bit about real life. So that was quite a long introduction because there's quite a lot of us. Um, Elizabeth Haynes has just said, that's better. Now you can see everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm sorry, I am a Luddite. Um, <laughs> that, that really is, I mean, how, how I didn't understand what I was clicking is ridiculous. So what we're here to talk about today, I'm sorry, this is a lot of me, but it will, it will, it will stop in a moment. What we're here to talk about today is law and order. Um, everyone who has attended the festival, everyone watching, is very interested in crime. And of course, so are we, because that's what we write. But it's also what we live. And so we thought it would be a good idea if we had two cops, two lawyers, and uniquely a senior Crown Court judge, just to have a little chat amongst ourselves about how what we do impacts on our writing uh, and just the everyday reality of being a cop and being a lawyer and being a judge, the everyday reality of the criminal justice system. So, starting then, um, I'm going to start off quite lightheartedly, I think, because it's a question that we've received um, over the weekend on Facebook. Just starting with everybody uh, on here. Now, not just books, TV as well. When you, I think it's Michelle Edwards actually asked this question, Michelle has just joined. Hi, Michelle. Um, when you watch or when you read, starting with Imran, what is the thing that annoys you most that they get wrong, that a writer or a director or a TV uh, producer, film producer, that they get wrong when they're displaying your side, the court side of, of what happens in real life? Um, hi, um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's, um, it's a real privilege and it's lovely to be here, especially with um, these fantastic other guests. Um, what, um, what annoys me? On TV, when they're dealing with courtroom scenes, uh, I, I think the thing that annoys me most of all is if you've got a barrister and he's wearing brown shoes. That's uh, <laughs> that's, that's a thing that annoys me. Um, I'm really quite annoyed when they start dealing with cross examination, and instead of having questions and answers, questions and answers, they just have a kind of speech, or you know, a question turns into a speech to a jury. I find that quite annoying. I can understand why you have to have it because it's dramatization in the end. Um, when, you know, they're making entertainment. So I, so I do understand that, but I think it'd be nice to have some questions, some answers, and to see the skill of the lawyer yeah. unraveling the witness rather than just making these speeches at, uh, <laughs> at witnesses. And that's the thing that annoys me most of all. Yeah, weirdly enough, I was, um, I, I, I've, I'm in the process at the moment of helping those who are trying to turn Killer Intent into a, my first book, into a TV show. And they wrote, they took what I'd written, the courtroom scene, and completely changed it in, in, the, um, in the script, and they got everything wrong. Right. I mean, they, they changed the case completely. They didn't even use it as a guide. They just got everything wrong. And I rewrote it and handed it back. And I was told that we, we know this might be real, but what you've just rewritten is 10 minutes of screen time. And that's just not going to happen. Yeah. So there are considerations that we just don't, that we don't appreciate, I guess. But, but I, completely, make, I completely get the frustration. Yeah, I think, but they could make sure that the magistrates don't have wigs on. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of basic things. That, that sort of thing. Neil, what about you? Um, going back to your day job or your former day job before you're in hiding in Scotland. Um, what, what really annoys you, what you see on TV or in books? I, I'm impossible to watch television with, with my, with the wife, because I mean, I sit next to her and I'm going, oh, fur chap, oh, cut, cut. And it's literally like this, and it is, it must be really annoying to sit next to. So, I mean, I could make a, a huge list, but really, the, the big thing, it's how cops are and how cops behave together, you know, because it's generally really quite relaxed. I remember one program I watched, I can't remember what it was, a few years ago. Firstly, they called the commissioner, the chief commissioner, I mean, how easy right. is that the to get right? The boss of the commissioners. <laughs> yeah, the boss of the chief commissioner. But they had the chief commissioner wander into this police station, wherever it was, and all the cops stood up and like stamped to attention, like guardsmen. <laughs> and I thought, I met pretty much all the commissioners during my service. If I'd have that said, done that to John Stevens, he'd have gone, are you taking the piss, son? <laughs> he really would have done. You know, I, all, the, all the commissioners, I'd have called them governor. It would have been friendly, yeah, respectful, yeah. obviously, but it, it's really it's the interactions and little things like you'll have a, 
you know, a, a sergeant, a desk, it's always a desk sergeant at a police station, which never is, it's always a civilian now. But, um, you know, he'll see and come face to face with a, a, a like a 21 year old detective and he'll call yeah. him sir. You know, it's just like, it's the interactions. While they make it, there's always, everyone's angry with each other. Yeah. And, it really isn't like that. It's a it's a far more laid back environment. Um, you know, if I called the commissioner sir, he'd have thought I was taking the piss. Yeah. So okay. you know, there's, there's a oh, I could go on forever. So I don't want to move on. That, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> no, we, 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 we may come back to it if we don't get any questions on the internet. We'll come back. <laughs> Lisa, what about you? Well, morning. Uh, so I just about to take a drink of water. Then. <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of. Of what Neil's just said then, but probably my biggest bugbear, and I do understand as a writer why this is, but it's having the usually the DCI, but a very senior officer doing everything. Oh, interviewing, yeah. arresting, down in the cells, out speaking to people, doing all the investigation, and then that's not their job. It's not a dig at them, it's not a pop at DCIs in any way, shape or form. It isn't their jobs. They're managers. Yeah. And they are in charge of the investigation, senior investigating officer. But having written books and I know that readers like to get on board with a main character and they're not always receptive if that main character is a detective constable, whereas in reality it's the DCs. And often as in Kent and in a lot of other forces you have civilian investigators, they're out doing the job as well and they're the ones that are going out taking statements. Not civilians arresting people, but they're arresting they're interviewing they're putting their files together and then the, the supervisors and the sergeants and the inspectors and the managers and so on and so forth that's my biggest bugbear but again i could probably go on for about another 10 minutes but i'll, I'll let someone else have a, have a, have a say <laughs> now, before we do that um you, I, I mentioned earlier you're a you're a, um, a detective in kent police what, what rank are you uh, at the moment i'm temporary detective sergeant but they see really Right. And um, are you expecting that to, to, to stay ultimately detective sergeant or will that come? Is that a, a, a manpower issue? Well, it's I've got the exams, so they asked me if I wanted to do it. But if I want to become a substantive sergeant, it's not quite hasty on the telly. I was watching Agatha Raisin only yesterday where the DC found my out. Friend make, my friend makes that show. It's a great I love show. it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. But it was the Barry Ryan. You should be watching this. <laughs> Uh, Bill Wong had got his said, congratulations you're a sergeant and I thought if only it was that easy um, because there's obviously a lot more work to go uh, from there on in. but if, if I put the work in and if I'm successful then yeah that, that could be a reality but fingers crossed for the way. Good luck best of luck with that uh, and Nigel we'll come up to Nigel Lithman you've, yeah, you've I, been in a lot of courtrooms Nigel uh, I, <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I annoys you the most? It's Imran that's, that's touched on the most important issue that arises. Shoes. Like brown shoes. Yeah. <laughs> but but Im, Imran, both for you and for everybody else, there's a very simple phrase that you can pass on, okay, which is men of renown never wear brown. Okay? <laughs> Just keep that in mind. And secondly, what uh, Neil told us about, so I take it, uh, Neil, that unlike Vera, you don't call everybody pet. In, what, when she charges someone with murder, she says, if that's all right with you, pet. No, uh, sort of frowned upon nowadays. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it push it, no, no, yeah that, that's going to land you in, the, in bother now. All right, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll quickly tell you about a judge on TV, then I'll tell you about John Deed, Judge John Deed. And I spent um, uh, some time advising uh, John Deed, particularly when David Ellington, my mate, wasn't available. They wanted another silk, they would, they would ring me up and get me in. And Martin Shaw and Jenny Seagrave were actually both very charming. But at lunchtime, after, after half, halfway through a shoot, Martin Shaw says, well, what do you think of, what do you think of it? I said, well, as accuracy, um, John, uh, Martin, it's, um, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, if you let's just think about it for a moment, uh, you have had a female barrister in front of you making an application at 10.30. At 12 o'clock, you sleep with her. <laughs> and then at two o'clock, when you come back to deliver judgment, you might have thought it was a bit risky to find against her. But in fact, that's what you did. You found against her. So that obviously, Martin, is complete garbage. But your wig looks very nice. And <laughs> At that moment, it was slightly skew whip, and so I straightened him. So the only straightened it. So the only thing I'd done, positive thing I'd done for the day, suddenly the director rushed up 
and push, pushed it back skew with. So <laughs> he said, I know it's wonky, but it was like that in the first shot, and we need <laughs> continuity. So the only advice I gave was not any of any use anyway, not for the first time. So how quickly were you sacked? <laughs> Well, considering what they were paying me, which was absolutely nothing, I was sat, I was sat just in time. <laughs> we, we've got our first question from um, Samantha Knights. Hi, Samantha. Thanks for uh, coming on to watch. Um, I think we're going to slightly change the question around because this is as a barrister. But in fact, I think this applies equally, Samantha, to, uh, to, to what the cop side of things do as well. So, so let's say as barristers or cops. You are privy to information which will never come out in court and which will never, therefore, not be in the public domain. Can you use this sort of information in your fiction books with names, places, circumstances changed, etc.? Um, Neil, what do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All the time. I mean, uh, throughout the career, the stuff that happens and you're going to draw on it um, wherever it comes from, whatever the source of that information is the stuff that doesn't doesn't come out at court you're going to draw upon that to to inform your fiction because it's goldmine stuff isn't it it hasn't come out you can change the names about change enough of the details but it's real because it has happened so the, the the realism that you want to give to your books is there because you're talking about stuff that ha has happened so it is obviously plausible because it's happened you just have to change enough so you don't get sued um but yeah i do it all the time. I mean, my first book, Going Dark, it's basically a direct lift of a case, really an amalgamation of two cases um, of corrupt solicitors. Oh, yes, that was fun. And uh, great fun to write, great fun to investigate. So I there's, can... There's no solicitors on here, so we can say stuff. No, no, that's why I'm happy to say it. Otherwise, I could have felt the daggers coming my way from the bar. Um, but that, yeah, so all the time. I think we all do it. Um, cops do it. I'm sure barristers do it. Yeah. Imran? I have to say, uh, once I fin finish with a case, I tend to forget the detail of it. Um, <laughs> uh, and I tend to forget what has actually been used as evidence and what's been deployed in evidence and what hasn't, what's been kept back. Um, but, I, but, I, but I agree uh, totally uh, with what Neil says. I think providing that you, providing that you um, fictionalize or anonymize the information, so there's no way of tracing it back to a particular client or a particular case, uh, then I think that's fine. But, I think the bigger, the bigger problem for me is that most of that stuff, most of the stuff which isn't used in evidence for me, it, it's usually the stuff which is just totally ludicrous. And I don't think that um, a, a reader would believe it as, as, as fiction because it's so bizarre, some of the stuff, or well, you, you'll know um, as well as I do, that some of the things that, that go on in a real trial yeah. are so crazy that if you wrote them as fiction, nobody would ever go for it. I remember a, a case I did not that long ago where a guy was being, a guy, uh, I think what had happened was that he had taken out about 10 life insurance policies the week before he faked his own death. And then when he was, <laughs> when he was eventually arrested for it, he pretended to be an imaginary twin of himself. <laughs> and, then, um, and then they asked him whether he felt uncomfortable about the fact that he was now living with his twins, his deceased twin's wife. <laughs> he said, oh, this is part of our culture. This is the sort of thing I have to do. And I've come all the way from India so, I, so that I can um, fulfill my obligation uh, to my dead twin brother. And it was, every time he was asked the question, it just got more and more ridiculous. At one point, he was shown a passport of, um, well, it was his passport, but he, he was asked, well, is that you? And it had the, the, other, the, the other guy's name on it. And he said, no, no, this is, this, is my, uh, this is my dead twin. He says, well, what about this passport? Is this you? And he said, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and the police officer interviewing him said, but it's, but it's the same photograph. <laughs> the same clothes in both photographs, in both passports. <laughs> Now, you try and use that in fiction, and, and people are just going to say this is ridiculous. So. Well, I, I've said many, many times, and he, at the outset of this, I said it, I've always wondered how you're going to follow up your first book, and I think you've just explained it. So, <laughs> <laughs> you've got to write that. It's got to be the book. <laughs> it, 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 I just don't think anybody would believe it. It's just not <laughs> in any way believable.
Speaking of your book, just because obviously we are all here to let people know that that's what we do, um, you've finally got your sequel coming out, haven't you? Um, well, it's book two, but it's not a sequel. Sorry, yes, your, 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 your second book, pardon me. Yeah, so the, so the second book. And the second book, so, so book one um, was essentially a jury speech done by a defendant who had sacked his renowned Queen's Counsel. No one's, and, no one's looking at Nigel. Yeah, nobody's looking at <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it definitely wasn't based on uh, Nigel Lithman, <laughs> Queen's Council, because nobody would have sacked him. But he had right. sacked the, his QC and did his own speech in the way that he that he would, or the imagine the way I imagined he would. Um, and I couldn't really do another book which had that as the conceit because I don't think it would have worked. Um, so, so the book two is a completely different um, premise. It's a, it's a young-ish, um, uh, um, bright, um, homeless man who um, ends up witnessing a murder which is committed in a house that he takes refuge in. And then when he reports it to the police and they go and investigate it, they see the house and it's a totally different house from the one he's reportedly murdering. So that's coming out in January, I hope. What's it called? It is called I Know What I Saw. I know what I saw. No, I, shouldn't, I, shouldn't yeah. know I know what I, I, was called, I know what I named it. I know, yeah. <laughs> Vaguely. <laughs> no, you've, you've mentioned this to me before, and I, I can't wait to read this. So, um, uh, you do need you do need to get better with your title. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't get to um, choose my title as the publishers do. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I, I've, I've had working titles for all my books, and all of them just get dismissed. Yeah, yeah, they say, oh, well, that's rubbish. Um, yeah. when you come into... <laughs> totally I think my problem is that all my working titles are based on Bruce Springsteen songs. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a good way of doing it, I think. <laughs> and, and Lisa, what's, um, what, what, what do you think about this? What's your opinion? Not on Imran's book or title, but on the original question. I like the title. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Uh, it's a little bit of what both Imran and Neil have said. I don't ever just use the murders that I've worked on and investigated because of the part of that that would cause huge, huge distress, obviously, to the families, but I would also be fired. But you can't really help but pick up things as you go. And, and, and again, I agree, there's been some very bizarre things that I've worked on that if you wrote those down, even your editor would say, I, I don't know where you're coming from with this. This is quite a ludicrous, preposterous idea. And and the truth is stranger than fiction but you, you can't help but you go through things you pick things up and again going back to what Neil was saying about police officers and how they interact with each other the whole reason I wanted to start writing crime fiction in the first place was to show people police officers are just average people who are doing a bit of a bizarre job and they are just family people they are normal people and they're a good and bad and the, the latest book I wrote was about police corruption because it does go on obviously not on a huge huge scale but you can't really help but pick things up as you go along and you turn them into hopefully the best crime fiction you can yeah and I, i'm gonna i'll answer the question for me because it will bring nige into this conversation um my my second book uh was actually a, a what if about a case that occurred but it wasn't the case i was in it was a case that he was in um and I remember being quite new to, uh, to my chambers, new to the profession. Uh, I was a second six pupil, I think. And, and there was a sort of a, a bit of, a bit of a, um, atmosphere, a bit of electricity going on in the chambers about a per certain person was about to be released. And they had searched this person's cell. And when searching the cell, they had found a list of all the people from his trial that he considered to be enemies. And he was going to kill them. So, weirdly enough, he wasn't let out. Um, and I remember, even back then, I must have been about 24, I remember watching it thinking, uh, watching all this going on, it wasn't affecting me, uh, and thinking, be an interesting idea for a book if they had let him out. I mean, what, about, what if they hadn't found the book? That ultimately became this book, Mark for Death, uh, which is my only legal thriller, and is a book about my barrister character defending somebody in a, in a jury trial, whilst at the same time, members of the legal profession are dying and the sort of circle of them seems to be getting closer and closer to him. And actually, uh, that was inspired by something that happened to Nige. So Nige, you remember that case, don't you? Well, Tony, only too well, but I'm, I suppose I should thank you for reminding that potential killer about what he promised. <laughs> 
That was really, really very, very helpful. Um, we haven't mentioned his name. Hello, <laughs> he, he's in the acknowledgements. <laughs> strange enough, not from that tape, but another one, I think, I was thinking when Neil um, and Lisa were speaking, that strange enough, the amount of information that you come by, although of course the whole world's your oyster, and as Imran says, there's nothing so strange as um, fact in our, in our world, far stranger than fiction. But the police's approach, so far as information intelligence is concerned, the first depository for that information is the police. And how, particularly in the old days or the older days, how they um, di di displayed it, how, what they did with it, how they deployed it, I'm sorry, uh, is as much of interest as anything else. It's up to them, it would used to be up to them as when they release it. So I remember a team, a particularly strong team of police officers uh, who used to operate in Essex. And at one stage, one of them said to uh, me, who was leading the, the uh, prosecution team, would it help if we found the car? And I said, well, yes, obviously it would help if you found the car. And two days later, the car was found. And that, I suppose, is just an example of how the police have the information, particularly in the old days. Nowadays, they have to be more upfront. Who knows how they are, whether they are or not, but they're supposed to be more upfront. And so they have all of this material at their fingertips and they have um, a control over it. You guys, having written books and publishers, of course, are able to deploy the information as part of fiction or part of fact in any way you want. Imran, don't w worry about. Um, uh, that you, you forget so much because I've always said that instant forget in our job is far more useful than instant recall. <laughs> Otherwise, you just get completely bogged down with everything. There you go. Uh, on, 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 on that same, just finishing off that question because we've, we've touched upon, Neil certainly touched upon, and, and Imran in detail about the, the things that are absurd and you know, the things that you just have to leave out. And when I wrote Mark for Death, and again, this is going back to that same guy, Nigel, again, won't mention his name, in case he's uh, ever, <laughs> ever, ever sort of at liberty. Um, but this same person, uh, I, I based much, I, I based very much of my main, my, my bad guy on this, my antagonist on this person, and what I knew of his ability, and what I knew of what he did. And I had to leave, I, I had a few reviews, people saying, well, come on, this guy's far too able. Why can he do this? Why can he do that? Where's his training? As an aside, I always find it very interesting that reviewers insist that if you're going to have a hard character, you must have training of some sort. Where's his training? Some of the hardest people I've ever met in my entire life have never had any training, and they'll still rip your head off. So that's just absurd. But anyway, going back, oh, where's this guy's training? And I'd actually left something out of the book about this chap. Um, a very good friend of, of mine, Nigel's, represented him for something else. When he was arrested for the terrible thing that he'd done, um, that night, the case Nigel was involved in. The police, it could be perceived that the police decided he wasn't going to get enough justice. And uh, the reason we would say that is that uh, his cell door was left open and he was in handcuffs in his cell, the cell door was left open. Um, Julie, when he went through the cell door, he walked into 10 riot geared police officers. And this guy who was what, no, he's five, eight and about 11 stone, put yep. six of them in hospital and I left that out of the book because nobody is going to believe that. No one will believe that. Um, and yet I got criticized for saying he was too tough anyway, but I'd left the ridiculous stuff out, even though it's completely true. So you can't, you can't sort of win for losing, can you? Well, on, on that, Tony, um, your, your police officers may be interested and may have had the same experience, that when I used to prosecute in, uh, more than I did latterly at the beginning of my, uh, my career, um, I've had police officers come to me and say, just as they're on their way out of the chamber's door in a conference, and say, oh, he did confess to the crime. He said, actually, look, you did, you really did get me banned to rights. I really did do it. I said, can I ask why you didn't tell me this an hour ago? And he did just say, well, who's going to believe it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point, isn't it? I mean, you guys, uh, and Neil and Lisa, must, must really uh, sort of relate to that. Yeah, well, very much. I mean, early days, I mean, I joined um, early 1990. And 
in the early days, I mean, really, they'd only just got used to the change in interviews from the old way of doing it under the judges' rules, which was, you know, you'd write it down, sort of, to through to tape recorded. In fact, at Kilbert, when I at Harleston, the first nick I went, there wasn't a tape machine. So you, if you interviewed someone, it was it was handwritten. I mean, you know, it was carefully handwritten and never, they, all everything signed and it was all good. Um, but it was about the reliance on interviews then. And it would be a case of you do the interview and the guy wouldn't have it. And you'd go back and you'd go upstairs and the DCI would say, has he had it yet? And you'd go, no, he's not having it at all. He goes, well, best you fucking get back down there, son, and keep going. <laughs> it. And it literally would be. Now, we've seen it. And again, I've seen this huge evolution in the interview from there where there was no training. There was no tape machines to start with through to this thing where you have all the tiers of interviews and an interview now is a real exercise in closing down future defences. Obviously, everybody expects a no comment interview now. So, but a no comment interview doesn't mean the interview stops, quite the opposite. A no comment interview is hugely important to be, make it so that the judge can, when these no comment interviews carry, the judge can then say to the jury, he made no comment, make of that what you will. So he had every chance to answer all of these chance, things. Whereas, yes. You know, and, and but you've got to have done your job properly as an interviewer so that someone like Nigel can actually make that direction. Yeah. And so it's not all been wasted because I mean, back before then, we could say nothing about the fact. So yeah. I've seen the evolution from interviews being this try and just keep going at him until he confesses through to now. Let's have a more professional approach so that we can use what he doesn't say against him as well as what he might say. So. Again, a huge evolution, but, but really interesting to watch. Well, you talk about no comment, and, and I think that that, that that could potentially go one step further to that as well. When we first started, when I first started, um, and certainly I'm sure when Imran first started, because it was before me, uh, yeah, the, the rule was always, uh, and you know, Nigel and I have defended in enough cases where we even had this discussion, the rule was always try and keep your defendant out of the witness box, because it is never going to make your case better. It was always your high point of your case is before he gets in that box because it's always going downhill from there. And I am actually a big believer that this has changed. Uh, no comment has changed and no evidence has changed because I think we now live in a world of social media where everybody shares everything. And, you know, I've got, I'm, I hadn't touched Twitter until four years ago. And then my publisher said, you need a Twitter account. And now I'm, you know, I'm trying to stay off it because you know, I, I have too many opinions and too many things. So even I'm doing it as somebody who's not inclined that way. We're kind of in a world now where everyone shares everything. And I think if you don't get in a witness box now and give your explanation, and if you don't give at least a prepared statement in an interview, the natural inclination of a jury, uh, and I'd be interested to see what you think about this, Imran, the natural inclination of a jury now is to think, well, why not? Because we, t I mean, I tell everyone, you've got people in there who tell you what they had for dinner. And, you know, it's just like, oh, here's a picture of my meal last night. Why won't you tell me whether you murdered him? And I genuinely think that's a real problem now with, certainly as a defence barrister, it's, it's a real problem. What, uh, Imran, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I have to say I totally agree. I mean, I've gone from um, a general rule of not calling uh, a defendant particularly if he's given an account and interview, because then, we're, then what you're allowed to say, what you can say is, look, he's given that account and interview. He was effectively cross-examined by police um, who have experience and they know what they're doing. And how can it help you if he gets into the witness box and, and repeats exactly what he said in his interview? And, and to that extent, you can insulate your client. But I've now got to the stage exactly like you, where I think um, as a rule, I have to call the defendant. And this usually means I mean, it usually means more comedy, in fact, because you're calling yeah. defendants that you would never have called before uh, for all kinds of reasons. And I had one um, defendant not that long ago who, in the witness box, <laughs> he's been cross-examined by um, prosecution, and the prosecution is saying, and he's faced about 10 counts of, of, of various offences. Prosecution was putting the case and says, hey, you know, you're guilty of all of these. And he said, memorably, on my kids' lives, oh. counts one, three, five, and nine, I didn't do. <laughs> and the prosecution says, what about the others? He says, oh, well, I didn't do those either. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so yeah, so it, it allows for a bit more comedy, but I think, uh, and I think your um, analysis is probably right, Tony, 
I think it's this shift from privacy um, that everybody used to hold dear. Every, every man, every ordinary citizen would feel it uh, kind of a, a right to hang on to their privacy. But now there seems to be no value in that kind of privacy, as you say, if you're getting up in the morning and you're sharing your breakfast with the, with the world and your yes. every thought with the world, then you know, a jury, particularly a young jury, expects you to get into the witness box yes. and give an account of yourself. Otherwise they will, I think, convict you. Yep. Can I just add to that point? Because it's a really, really good point, um, which I hadn't considered in those terms. But the very last big trial I did was a three-handed um, facilitation, uh, immigration facilitation. They were breaching the, the, what is called the Lil Loophole, bringing this, um, an Albanian gang, bringing Albanians through the Eurotunnel using what used to be a little loophole you could get by. And it was wholly circumstantial, the case, wholly circumstantial, but very strong. And the, we absolutely aced the trial. And, and, you know, we all knew that, that there was going to be a good result in it for us. And the, the prosecution barrister was a, a, a right character. He's an ex-cop and something of a hooligan, I would say. And I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, his, his <laughs> closing speech, I joke you not at the end of it. Now, they all, because there was no way that the defence counsel could have put them in the box. They would have just been destroyed. Um, because they'd seen how, you know, uh, the, our prosecution barrister dealt with all the, pro the defence witnesses. And so they didn't put them in. And I joke you not, his closing speech, I've even got a prop for this. He stood up, did it. At the jury. For about 15 to 20 seconds. And he then just went, deafening, isn't it, silence? And then sat back. <laughs> Brilliant. And then the rest of his speech was, I don't know, 10 minutes? Yeah, didn't and need the rest that, of it, I imagine. No, they didn't. And literally, the three blokes got <laughs> seven and a half years each. So, you know, it, 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 I just think it's really interesting how that has changed. What, what do you think, Lisa? What, what's your... Uh, no, no, yeah, no. As the, oh, sorry. As uh, sometimes officer in the case or one of the investigating team for both rapes and for murders, when you hear that the defendant is going into the box, you're like, oh, brilliant, because they're an idiot. And this is going to seal their fate. And I've sat there before and I'm thinking, this is just brilliant from a, a prosecution point of view. I can't believe you've actually let this person loose and you're allowing them to talk because they, you can just see the jury and they're, you can see they can't quite believe what they're hearing. And, and one of the closing speeches was uh, um, from defence after the, he'd allowed his defendant, sorry, he'd allowed the defendant to get into the box and that really didn't help him didn't, didn't really improve matters in any way shape or form and in his closing speech he referred to his own client his own client as mr stupid from stupidville but please don't let that you know sway you in any way and it was a unanimous jury for guilty verdicts yeah. within about i don't know 10 15 minutes it didn't take very long because he did just stand up and say the most horrendous things and he put down the witnesses who come to court and the jury didn't like it, they didn't like it at all. He did absolutely no favours for himself. I think one of the problems that we face as Defence Council is the, uh, there's a kind of perpetuated myth that we are allowed to in some way coach a defendant mm. to get him ready to give evidence. Hang on, hang on, are, are we not? <laughs> <laughs> Bar standards born get very in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, and I think that's part of the problem. Uh, I think what happens is the jury looks at your defendant and thinks, oh, "Hang on, this is after yeah. counsel sat with him for two days and made sure he got his story straight." Mm. What they don't realise is that you absolutely can't do that, and you definitely can't do that with witnesses. Mm. And you and we are calling witnesses as blind as everybody else um, to yeah. some extent. We're, we're putting them in the box. We hope they're going to come up to proof, which means that they that they say what they've said in a witness statement that they've handed to your sisters or to you. And you hope they're going to roughly say that and you hope that um, they're going to be credible and all the rest of it. But you don't know until, <clears throat> until you put them in. The reverse can often be true, which is if you've got somebody um, who you think is going to be awful, they can sometimes be brilliant um, and surprisingly brilliant, not just because they're brighter than you think they're going to be, or it can often be because they're more um, naive. Um, yeah. 
expect them to be. And that naivety comes through sometimes, as honesty. It's, can, I mean, it's, it's, try and, um, can, I, can I try and uh, contribute, sort of both from practice and from sitting? First of all, so far as practice is concerned, I always used to think that it is certainly your job, whilst not coaching, that's absolutely right. But the other side of it is not to say to a client, it's your right to give evidence, which or not, and it is his right to give evidence or not, and that's all the assistance I'm going to give. Giving, giving a client advice is perfectly legitimate if he doesn't suborn his own, his own rights, and, and that's what should be expected um, of you. So far as uh, generally what's the, what should you be aiming at, you should be aiming at leaving your client in the best possible position. And although you may not understand what you mean by saying, and of course you can call supportive evidence that doesn't help and does the opposite, but you've got to mitigate against that. You, you don't take risks, that, that's what you So in some of the bigger trials, particularly in America that I've noticed, um, Harvey Weinstein uh, go, not going into the witness box, who on earth was going to give him any sort of result mm. unless he went into the witness box? Uh, my Iron Mike Tyson, uh, when he was charged with rape, not giving evidence, but calling witnesses on his behalf. I always took the view, if you're not going to give evidence because it's, it's thought you're going to be lying, why call somebody else to lie on your behalf? Yeah, here's my mate, he's a better liar than me, so listen to him. Yeah, exactly. And, but as for when the, the, the fashion of calling rather than not calling your client, of course it's based on judges directing inferences can be drawn against the defendant, but there's generally, isn't there, supposed to be now a levelling up, the levelling up of uh, a, a jury taking against a client who doesn't give evidence, a levelling up about a jury hearing about the bad character of a defendant, and so on and so forth. But when we finish this topic, Danny, I want to get back to what Neil was talking about, the evolution of what he referred to as judges' rules. Yeah. Because I, 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 shall I touch on it now? No, touch on it now, that'd be very interesting. I'll, I'll um, yeah, I'll, I'll it's a natural touch. time to do it. Right. <clears throat> what, what, the, the extension of what Neil was talking about, of the uh, police officer's duty in those days not being so closely scrutinized that he was able to make a, an account of an interview um, in slightly less formal circumstances, if that's the right way to refer to the back of a cigarette packet. And then when he gives his evidence, the defendant would object to its admissibility and it would be for the judge to decide who is telling the truth. The policeman, he did say it, or the defendant who says, I didn't say it. Surprise, surprise. All of the time through which I lived through, um, at, at practicing um, at, the, at the junior bar anyway, was it was always decided in favour of the policeman. Every case heard in the magistrate's court, which again was largely one word against another police against the defendant, it would be decided in, on behalf of the policeman. And that is really from going back to the traditions as mm -hmm. to what sort of people the defendants might be, very often uh, people of quite low uh, moral standing, by which I mean uh, the sort of offences that they commit. But generally, if a judge has to choose one side, historically, he would choose the side of the policeman. And that's what's going to lead into what I feel strongly about, um, as do many, and which is why the manuscript that I've most of the way through preparing of a book would be, it is the fact that people are loath to accept a judge or a magistrate in to supplant the role of a jury. Because right. the jury has evolved in a different way and a way in which the criminal justice system in my view, has had a, a, the correct approach to have um, its faith in a, jury, in a jury. But it's from Neil, the days that you were yeah. talking about, which we refer to as the bad old days, um, 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. 
that we've come to the position that we're in. Sorry, can I, can I just can I just put that in context, Nigel? Because um, I, I, I was going to come to this in about five minutes or so. But we'll come yeah. to it now. No, we'll come okay. to it now because um, we can come back to the questions. We'll probably run over the hour a bit, to be honest. But we can come back to the questions that are on the screen. Um, just so everyone who's watching understands what we're talking about. Obviously, this panel is about real life criminal justice as well. And I think there's no more important thing at the moment, no more important development at the moment than the suggestion that's coming out of this government this week that we get rid of juries for certain crimes. Um, when you have crimes, you have summary only offences, which are very minor offences. You might think of them as misdemeanours. Um, and in a misdemeanour, a summary only offence, that's dealt with by the magistrate's court. The conviction rate in a magistrate's court is astronomical. And what Nigel was just saying there uh, in relation to when a decision had to be made, would it go the police's way or would it go the, the way of the, um, of, of the defence? Well, it almost always goes the police's way. We had a saying back when I was a pupil that the defendant was standing in the guilty spot. And that was effectively the decision that was made by the magistrates. So the suggestion now from the government, and they're blaming COVID-19, is that for more serious cases, so this only used to be summary cases, and bear in mind that if you were found guilty, you were automatically entitled to appeal. That's how much confidence they have in the system. Um, there are other cases, there are obviously indictment only cases for a very, very serious murder, conspiracy to, 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 to conspiracy to steal, conspiracy to do anything really, but murder, kidnap, robbery, etc., etc., which can only be dealt with by a jury. And then there are either way cases, which are cases that, that such as theft. You can steal something that's not worth five pound. You can steal something that's worth a million pound. So there's a big range. And there will be certain circumstances where, where what you've stolen, for example, is so small, the magistrates can deal with it. Others dealt with by the Crown Courts. But within that range, there are some very, very, very serious offences. And the suggestion is that we stop letting juries deal with them. And instead, we let them be dealt with by judges and by magistrates. And do remember what Nigel said about judges and uh, who they generally side with and what I've just said about magistrates. So it'd be interesting to, to know what everyone thinks about this. It really is the hot topic at the moment. And it's, it's great that we've got this opportunity to talk about it, especially given that we've got two cops here. Because, I mean, I'd be really interested. I, I think we'll start, in fact, we've heard what Nigel has to say, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, because as a Crown Court judge, I mean, as one of the men that will be asked to take the place of the jury, there's no one better to hear from, in my opinion. But um, if we can start off, I think, with, uh, if we start off with Neil. Neil, what, what's, your, what's your take on this? What do you think about the suggestion that we can get justice by just getting rid of the jury and having a judge and two magistrates? Yeah, this is, this is a tricky one. And I can sit outside it, you know, I'm a retired cop now. But we could all look at ourselves and put ourselves at a time in our life where if circumstances were different, if the luck was against you, whether it's a nasty traffic accident, whether it's you have to defend yourself and you end up smacking someone and you maybe break their jaw, you're innocent, you know? Who do you want to be tried by? You know what, I, I would rather sit, stand, if I had to get tried at court, I would rather stand in front of a jury I, I think, you know, the real world experiences that you get from 12 people give you the best opportunity of them applying logic and common sense. Again, not universally. Some of the juries you see make you shake your head. However, I think as, as, a, as an average, averaging out across all the criminal trials, you stand your best chance of applying real world common sense to the situation you found yourself in. I can, you know, again, giving an example, again, this wouldn't apply because it, it ended up being um, the guy died, but mm. uh, there's a guy with a long criminal history. He was a horrible, horrible piece of something, big piece of work. He started on a guy outside a pub. This guy was a decent person, working man. The guy pulled a knife on him. He retaliated. He chinned him. The guy falls on the pavement and fractures his skull and he dies. Now, obviously, we know this would end up at the Crown Court, but it's just indicative of the situation so a normal person can find themselves in. Yeah, and see, that, that's, that's, I think, is the key thing. Whenever you talk about criminal justice to people, and you know this, because I mean, you were a cop, so you can look at this from, not as a defence lawyer, you, you were the other side, and you know this from your experience, and, and Lisa, I'd, I'd ask you the same sort of thing. The reality is, isn't it, is that, uh, well, everyone looks at this and says, well, it doesn't matter. You know, whether they're cutting legal aid fees, whether they're getting rid of juries, because it's not going to be me. 
it's criminals. It's only <laughs> criminals. But uh, Lisa, I mean, <laughs> that you're a cop. Do you agree with that? Is it is it not possible that it's yeah is it, that, that the, 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 the this could happen to anyone? Could happen to anybody, and I wouldn't want to see the jury system abolished. I exactly as Neil said, if I was going to go to court for something, or a member of my family or a friend was going to go and face a trial at Crown Court, I'd want there to be a jury. Juries, it, sometimes you do, if I'm honest, look at some of them, and I did do a uh, jury service on uh, a, an inquest, inquest at Coroner's Court, and listening to what some of the other jurors were saying, yeah, it was a little bit concerning. I won't deny that. However, what you're doing is you're presenting as the police, you're obviously giving the, the information to the prosecution and the defence are obviously doing their, their part quite correctly and there's certain rules to follow that things cannot be released to the jury because it would prejudice what they're going to say. I think we've and lost you, Are oh, you back, sorry. If you lose me then, I think we, I've just, tried. Just, just for a moment, just for a moment. I think I'm uh, you're still there. Can you hear us? Uh, I think you're back. Yes, I can. Sorry, my, I keep freezing. Apologies, am I? We're, we're, we're losing. Do, you, do you mind if I move on to Imran and see if your reception gets a bit better in the meantime? Imran? I think I, we have to assume the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, as, as you described it, it's the hot topic of the day. And um, for me, I think it's the most important um, question that we face in the criminal justice system because it, it goes right to the heart of the, the notion of justice because it's one thing having a framework for justice is one thing having laws to determine um, how we approach the question of uh, criminality but you also have to have the implementation of justice it has to be carried through and there's something about having um, 12 um, ordinary people drawn from the uh, ordinary members of the public which produces a kind of magic that is absent from a uh, single uh, judge court. And I think that's to do with not just that they bring their own life experiences. And if you've got 12 people, you've got 12 times the experience and 12 times the life experiences. Um, but it's also that because you've got that kind of richness of texture, what you're dealing with is potentially experience of a jury which matches or could match the experience of a defendant. And you might have some defendants who say, well, I don't feel it's entirely fair for me to be uh, judged by <clears throat> this um, particular judge who went to Eton and had a privileged um, upbringing. He won't know anything about the circumstances in which a, a young person might have to carry a knife, or he won't know about the circumstances in which uh, one has to resort to dishonesty in order to um, achieve some other uh, higher objective. He doesn't know about having to steal a loaf of bread to feed your family, but yeah. a jury might. So it brings together that kind of wider element. And it gives you, I think, a, a sense of justice that, um, that is, is hard to resist. And ultimately what you want is uh, when a defendant has been tried, you want him to walk away from the process and say, that he's had a fair go. And I yeah. often have uh, defendants who said, even when they're being convicted, they've said, well, I've given it a fair go, or it felt to me yeah. this jury paid attention. And of course, I, uh, but I also understand what uh, Lisa, I think, was getting at when she said, you know, there are some worrying things that you hear about juries. I heard uh, something recently where a jury was um, in deliberation, and the, uh, I, I heard this from a journalist, in fact, who was telling me that he was appointed the, um, the the chairperson and he went around the room after this trial and they were deliberating and said oh, what does everybody think taking a straw poll and went round and everybody was going yes guilty yes not guilty whatever as they were going round he finally got to <laughs> one guy he said what do you think guilty or not guilty initially and he said well I think not guilty but I think the other guy guilty and he said what other guy because <laughs> the other guy I didn't really like the other guy I think he's guilty. He's going, what other guy? He says, the one who's sitting in the dock with him. He says, no, no, that's the interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd gone through the whole trial 
that there were two people on trial. <laughs> and the one he'd heard nothing about was guilty. Yeah, he, he was wondering why that, he says they kept, he keeps muttering to the other one, keeps muttering. <laughs> and he didn't give evidence and I didn't really trust him. So Imran, <laughs> having now totally undermined anything that we'd say positive about jury, <laughs> Nigel, <laughs> I, I, I want to come back to you because obviously, uh, as you were saying, You've been working on a manuscript <laughs> about almost exactly this point, haven't you? A manuscript, yeah. I think, is a, is a mix of, of your own experiences, but also your opinion from the bench on, on this very question. So it couldn't really be more timely. I have to say at this point, can you please finish that? And can you please have that published? And yeah. anyone who's watching this who wants to publish this, because this is the man to come to. Um, I'm ready to go, yeah. And so I'm going to ask you uh, to, to address the issue. But before I do that, I'm going to read out something from Samantha Knights. And I apologise to everyone. Yeah, we, 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 I'm not really keeping on top of the questions that are being put in because what's coming back for me is, is, is so interesting anyway. But Samantha Knights has said, in relation to the judge-jury issue, another angle is the lack of diversity in our judiciary, so gender, BMAE wise. What does His Honour Judge Lithman think needs to happen to improve the figures? Progress on this to date has been far too slow. Would also be interested to ask other panellists how much they think it matters who the judge is. Uh, well, my, my, my answer to that, very, very briefly, is if the judge is deciding on fact, then it's really bloody important who the judge is, because I know who I'd like to be in front of and who I wouldn't. Um, but that's all I'll say on that, because I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear really from Nige. Um, okay. Not well, just on that question, but just no, no, no. Uh, overall. What, what, what is, as, as a judge, as the man they would be saying, so, Mr. L um, His Honour Judge Lithman, is this person guilty or not? What, what, what are your t what's your take on it? Well, my take is, is that even if an individual judge, and hopefully it would be the, the norm, is totally fair, there would be the perception or the fear of the perception of a cynicism. And that cynicism comes from, we've looked at one example as the way it's arrived through history, if you like, and through tradition. And also, if you think about it, the sort of, hot, I, I, having gone onto the bench three years ago, I came from a background of heavy crime and that means looking at horror stories absolute horror stories decapitations fathers killing daughters mothers killing sons uh, and so on and so and so forth and for those reasons they come of course from an from a, from a position whereby they have been open to those horrors but there's not just the fear or the perception of cynicism that arises but the jury system we all agree subject to the occasional and very and unusual uh situation actually the system works they reach we would say the right result and what do i mean by that that i have instances where there is a piece of evidence it may be cogent evidence but it, was, it is not deemed sufficient by the jury to convict upon the basis of it. And you can almost see or hear the way, the way their mind has worked. Yes, there was some evidence, but we are not convicting based on that sort of evidence. Conversely, there are situations where you hear, uh, apocryphally later on, as we all do, that a jury has not convicted because although they thought their inference impression was there was guilt, there was not the evidence. And so they're able to distinguish between the two. And thirdly, as far as experience is concerned, I have found nothing is beyond their ability. And so uh, a particularly complex piece of forensic evidence based on smoke deposits in a murder, they dealt with absolutely without a question at all. And going right back to uh, a million years ago, the Guinness trial, that was obviously a trial relating to share dealing in the city. But as two people who I heard from later said, but ultimately all that was happening was there was, as usual in fraud, somebody had their hands in the till. So why can't a jury deal with that topic? Yeah. So if we have to, find other ways because of COVID to try and change. The one thing that mustn't change in my view is the concept of the, is the concept of 
the jury. Now, as I've said, of course, there are eccentric situations that arise. As with, as with Imran's um, uh, a jury that, that, that couldn't deal with... Um, Devastating example. <laughs> exactly. Um, Short-sightedness. I too, uh, when I was in practice, um, had a juror who at the end of the trial went to try and get appeal papers for my client. And the uh, general office at the court said, well, why do you want appeal papers? You're, you're a juror, aren't you? Yeah, but I think he should appeal. Anyway, when that was brought to the court's attention, and there was a, an initial inquiry, the juror had been going to the prison and seeing him on false visiting orders. And as I said later, the only two things this man could be said about him were, one, he was able to shoot a man's leg off at about 40 meters. And secondly, he hadn't washed his hair, so far as I could see, for nine months. Now, if that was sufficient for a juror to, um, to fall in love with him, well, so, so be it. It can be eccentric. But the system works. Don't, don't change it. So far as a really important question of lack of diversity uh, is, is concerned, I was practicing. Uh, I, I chose to go to the bench instead of retiring. Uh, it was only going to be for a few years. The, I, sp I spent 18 months in Luton, a completely diverse um, community, both in terms of people in the dock, people at the bar and lawyers, and people on the jury. That enormous diversity was fantastic to see. And although it can be an, uh, uh, an inappropriate expression, please forgive me if I'm using what is thought of as an inappropriate expression, I became, if I wasn't already, which I think I was, but I became totally colorblind. In other words, I remember somebody coming to the court and saying to me, it was one of my relatives, the defendant in the dock is black, how does he feel about the fact that he does not have what appears to be West Indians on the jury? And although he may not, may not have been West Indians on the jury, there were certainly people of other different ethnicities. And I was able to say, do you know, I hadn't even noticed. And I don't think anybody in that courtroom has noticed. So there has been, in my view, progress. But in terms of actually getting bums on seats, as judges, they've got to apply, and they've got to, and and they've got to be fed, and they've got to be fed through the system. Uh, can, but, I, can I just, can I just comment on that one, Rachel? Yeah, because it's something that, that often annoys me, and it really annoyed me when Liz Truss, back when she was our wonderful Lord Chancellor, decided to talk about it. I genuinely feel, certainly from two thousand and two when I started, that the bar was very much ahead of the game in terms of diversity. Certainly in terms of sex, in terms of female to male, there's been more female barristers coming through than male barristers for a very long time. Um, and Imran, I'll, I'll be corrected by you on this, I think in terms of diversity, sort of, certainly Asian representation is not, is not poor. I do think there is a, 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 something to be said that there's not quite enough black barristers. Um, but my view has been, when you're looking at the upper echelons, when you're looking at QCs, when you're looking at um, the bench, etc. Uh, they do have, I mean, every, we, we, when you, let's say it's been 20 years that it's been right. It takes that long in order to get to the level you need to be at, to be, to be in that position. You can't say, well, we've got as many ladies coming in now as men, so therefore immediately make them QCs so the QCs are equal, or immediately make them judges so the judges are equal. The, the reality is I think we're going in the right direction, and we've been knocked back on that very badly by the way that legal aid fees have been cut and all the other attacks on the bar. Yeah. Um, I, I, come from a, uh, I come from a council estate in West London. I couldn't be a barrister. I couldn't be a young barrister now. I could not absolutely do that. I would have to go and do something Well, you else. couldn't be a young barrister. That's I certainly it. couldn't be a young barrister. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but you know, you, the, the me you met in 2002, Nige, could not be, um, could not be doing what I was doing then. It's just not possible. Absolutely right. And, and so the diversity has taken a knock. And so, so to have someone from the current Tory government stand up and say there's not enough um, black QCs, not enough uh, female QCs, etc. Um, actually, there would have been in time and the time that it would take to naturally get there uh, because we were ahead of the game. But now we've had an impact. It's harder for women now because of childcare, because they're not earning enough. 
and the bar to be able to have their children looked after. It's harder for people from ethnic backgrounds. It's harder for people from working class backgrounds. They've made it less diverse. Uh, and I think yeah, when you look at those criticisms, I mean, you have to take into account how long it takes to reach the level that you expect people to be at to be a judge or to be a QC. Let me just let me just add one sen one sentence, which I propose to anyway, and then I'll shut up. And that is that, uh, other than fighting for the right for juries to uh, continue as our, as a base of our system, the other fundamental is, of course, a properly remunerated profession, which would which would address the matters that you said. As you, as you know, I fought for that in the strikes that we had yep. for the bar in 2014. Uh, and it must, and, and there must be strength in the uh, representations that we make so far as proper remuneration is concerned. The, the, when I was interviewed on, on Radio 4, on the Today programme, they would not believe that young members of the bar were not earning 60 and 70,000 pounds. When I was telling them that they're actually on minimum wage, all said and done, uh, that they simply dismissed it. Yep. Well, and, and that's still the case further down the line after two more bouts of cuts. Okay, right, we are well over time. I'm gonna ask one question that we've been asked much earlier, and that's to get things a bit lighter and to bring everyone back on board. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna be finishing off with this. I wanna start with Lisa. Paul Harvey has asked, within the legal community, so cops or, uh, or, or lawyers, within the legal community, there must be some real characters. Are you ever tempted to base characters in novels on your colleagues? Lisa, and can you even tell us? Well, I'm hoping my internet's not going to cut out again. Apologies for that earlier. Um, when I started writing, because I didn't want to get into trouble, I did contact M Police's legal department and say, look, I'm not going to base this on actual real people. They're not going to be real victims. They're not going to be real colleagues. However, you can't obviously go through your life meeting people and not thinking we are fun or it's fair game here. I'm going to use a part of this person's character and I'm going to amalgamate this. And so you can't really help but do it. Although I've never actually just thought you'll do. I did base the DI in my, in my current series on all the great bits about every DI that I'd ever worked for that I've really had, had a lot of time for and just kind of put them into one sort of beer drinking, rugby playing, sweary, moany, I love that they're the great bits. Exactly. <laughs> you, know, you, kind of, you want that kind of person on your team fighting your corner for their staff. And, and then that was my DI, Harry Powell. And I thought, you're not a real person. But if you were, I'd come work for you any day of the week. So I try not to do it, but you can't really help but just think that bit's fun. I like that quirk. I like that characteristic that person has. So, yeah, a little bit of everything, really. As you go through life, you just kind of gather them up, don't you, and use these bits of character. Yeah. Um, before we move on, because this is the last question, obviously, for everyone, but before we move on from your answers to that, tell us a bit about your next book. It's called Don't Trust Him, and uh, at the time I had, don't hold this against me, but I worked in uh, PSD, Professional Standards, for a while. It really wasn't for me. It really, really wasn't for me. Uh, investigating police officers was not a lot of laughs, so I went back, I went scurrying back to uh, major crime as quick as I could. But it's about the, if you have somebody on your team, if the situation is right if corruption is allowed to build it's allowed to creep in there with all the cuts that police had as well as lots of other public and uh, private sector i appreciate they've been facing there's a little bit of angst in the incident room if someone comes in who turns your staff's heads in the wrong direction could it bring your incident room down and that was uh, dane hoopman was born and he, he he wandered into east rise police station which is sort of loosely based on uh, Folkestone Police Station. It's uh, near the sea, you can see France on a good day, that kind of thing. And uh, he, he worms his way into the incident room and is uh, thoroughly unpleasant. Okay, uh, Imran, so for, back to the initial question. Um, uh, so, so this was about whether I use uh, people I know as my characters. Or yeah. Um, one of the things I really struggle with is names. I hate naming characters. So what I end up doing is asking friends if they want to be named in the book. So I quite often have people who share, the, the, you know, who, whose names I've stolen uh, yeah. to feature in the book, but they're usually not um, their characters. Um, in terms of the characters themselves, the reality, the truth, the truthful answer is probably that in order to make the characters feel plausible, 
you have to have them as rounded individuals and the best way to make them rounded is to copy and borrow and paste from yeah. people that you know or or certainly take um bits of somebody's character and add them to bits of somebody else's character to make a rounded individual yeah i think it's impossible to do it otherwise because otherwise what what what, what are you doing you're inventing a character who will otherwise feel too dimensional i think you've got to take the experience that you have of somebody and their quirks and their individualities and put that into the character in order to make the character come alive, I think. Yeah. It's a boring answer. And I, well, we've already asked you about your next book. Remind us of the title, quick. Um, it is called I Know What I Saw. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you can remember it. <laughs> and Neil, what's your answer to the question about the characters? Yeah, I do it 100%. 100%. Um, in the first book, Going Dark, the, the sort of the main corrupt cop in there is just entirely a carbon copy of a DI I didn't like once. Um, <laughs> it was really, and it made it hugely cathartic and enormous fun to write. Yeah. And, and for a nice character, Stan, who is this big bombastic character, um, who he was, he was actually an office manager in the first CID office I worked. He just used to look after the cars. Mm. But he was an ex um, head of the probation service in a, for one region. And he just, just did the job for the cracks. But he knew everyone. Wherever it was, he knew. He could literally walk into the borough commander's office. And he just looked like Brian, just reminded me of Brian Blessed. So he was a perfect character. Huge amounts of fun to write. And I actually. Yeah. When they were making the audio book, I, um, the, the, I spoke to the, the actor who was going to do it. And he goes, what, what about this Stan character? And I goes, just do Brian Blessed with a Devonian accent and you've got him. And he literally did this big shouty crackers Devonian thing. So terrific fun. So yeah, 100%. I do it all the time. And the next book? Next book is called Going Back. Um, it's the third in the Tom Novak series. Um, and as, so for those of you who don't know, Tom is originally from Sarajevo. He's an asylum seeker from Sarajevo who came over in the early 90s. And uh, he has been asked to go back to Sarajevo to uh, infiltrate a gang of um, people developing a new weapon, which the Americans are very worried about. Uh, that will be out hopefully in the next couple of months. And that's going back. Going back. Going back. Uh, and my answer to the question in terms of character is absolutely. Um, I'm... I love stealing people from real life and sticking them in there. Nigel's going to find his way into a book soon. He thinks he already has, but he wasn't the judge that I killed in Mark the Dead. Uh, the best example probably is uh, my, my closest friend, very, very close friend of Nigel, is a man called Craig Rush. Craig was my pupil master, and I am um, uh, my, one of my recurring characters, Michael Devlin, is a barrister, and he has a pupil master who happens to be the same height as Craig Rush and very similar to Craig Rush in many, many, many ways. And he lives on the same lived on the same street in, uh, in Islington as Craig Rush. Um, the difference between the two, apart from their weight, because I made this character really, really quite fat for uh, just to differentiate him. Um, the other main difference is, of course, that Derek Reed, this character, um, was found crucified to a wall, <laughs> which really pleased Craig when he read that. But it's all right, you'll be back in the prequel at some point, I'm sure. So yes, I absolutely um, have used people from the past. And my next book, well not my next book, my current book, uh, which has been out since April, is Power Play. I had Mark for death here because I knew I was going to be speaking to Nigel. I forgot to have Power Play. Um, but you can find it on Amazon and in all good bookshops. It is a political thriller, uh, all about who runs the White House. The uh, tagline being, the enemies are on the gate, they're already inside which I'm pretty sure, judging by what we've been seeing about Trump and the Russian bounty on the head of the, uh, of the American soldiers, could be applied to real life as a tagline. We could put that as a tagline and think of, of Trump's entire presidency, couldn't we? The enemy is not at the gate, he's already inside. <laughs> anyway, um, I think we need to leave it there, guys. It's um, 17 minutes past our time. Uh, someone else is starting at 12.30, so we definitely have to stop. Can I thank everybody who's watched? Uh, William McIntyre has contributed, Samantha Knight, Louise Fairburn, Kim Booth, uh, Lyndon Smith, Terry Shepard. A lot of people have got involved. Um, so thank you very much. We've had quite a lot of lawyers watching. I hope this was interesting. Um, guys, thank you all very much for getting involved as well. And uh, I'm going to do something slightly cleverer than before. I'm going to try and share our screen. Um, so it says law and order, and then I'm going to cut the, <laughs> then I'm going to cut us off. So before I do that, thanks very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.